the opportunity to come and talk here today. I wanted to just uh, first of all start off by thanking uh, my co-authors who are listed up there. This is part of a, a much larger uh, project that we're working on with the people at Ames, uh, where we're looking at both spatial and temporal patterns of recruitment and things that are And um, what I'm going to talk about today is more specifically about uh, the habitat requirements of, of coral reef fish or the types of habitats that they associate with their juveniles or when they recruit. So we know, for example, that a lot of the, the juvenile fish actually recruit to the coral reef and basically spend, once they recruit, a lot of their life there. But we also know from working in other places in the world, particularly um, like the Caribbean, that a lot of fish also recruit to um, habitats that are adjacent to those coral reefs, so things like seagrasses and, and also <coughs> mangroves. One of the interesting things about a lot of the shallow water reefs along Western Australia is that often in quite, quite close proximity to the coral reef there's extensive macroalgal meadows. And so one of the things that we were interested in looking at was how important is this particular habitat for recruitment of things like fish, and is that somehow behaving like seagrass does in places like the Caribbean. If we look at the actual reef itself, we know that a number of uh, juvenile fish actually associate with live coral. And so work by uh, Jeff Jones in PNG, um, paper that was published in PNS in uh, 2004, suggested that about 65% of all the juvenile fish had really strong association with live coral. And when you had a disturbance where there was a massive decline in coral, then the diversity and the, the abundance of those fish tended to track um, the, the change in coral. We also know that um, a number of fish may actually associate not so much with the coral, but the structural complexity or the skeletons that uh, are made from those corals. And work by people like Nick Graham in the Seychelles has shown us that when that coral complexity breaks down or the framework of the reef collapses, you get uh, an associated decline in the small bodied fish. And a lot of these are juveniles for um, sometimes really important functional, functionally important species and species important to the fishery there. So there's this somewhat um, interesting idea about with the juvenile fish, are they actually associated with the live coral because it's live or is there something more important in terms of the structural complexity that's being provided there? Okay, so we, we obviously know quite a lot about uh, habitat associations of juvenile fish, but there's still a lot that we don't know. We don't know things about particular habitats and we don't know a lot about a broader suite of species. And this was something that was actually identified by a whole group of research scientists as something that should be a, a research priority. So in the talk that I'm going to, um, well, I am presenting, <laughs> um, I'm going to look at sort of three ecological scales of habitat association. So firstly, looking at uh, macroalgal beds versus the actual coral reef then live coral versus the coral skeletons or the structure associated with those corals, and then um, looking at the actual growth forms of corals that the fish associate with. So the study we um, carried out was, at all, all the work was done at uh, Ningaloo Reef. This is uh, uh, often described as a fringing reef, but particularly in the northern sector here, there's quite an extensive lagoon system and so you have a, a back reef area and then a lagoon which is three to four metres deep. And within there, there's quite extensive large macroalgal beds. So it provides an ideal <coughs> habitat to look at this use of macroalgal beds versus uh, the coral reef. We did um, a, a whole lot of sites in, inside the macroalgal beds and the reef and basically just had transects and would go along and when we saw a juvenile fish, would record its the species of that fish obviously, and then also the microhabitat that it was associated at that time. We then also got some sort of idea of the habitat that was available, so we were able to not only look at habitat use but, and look at that relative to availability. And one of the other things we did was that we recorded where we were seeing individual fish or where we were seeing large groups. 
And that was quite important because previous work by people like um, Hugh Swetman and Dave Booth have demonstrated that recruitment is often associated with comp specifics. And so when we did our analyses, we were doing it at the group level rather than the number of individuals that we see. Okay, so this first um, graph here just shows the probability of uh, seeing each of these species in either a macroalgal or coral reef type habitat. And it was done within a, a, a Bayesian type framework which explains why some of these error bars are, are crazy on one side and very small on the other. But basically what, what we've said is that for each species, if those 95% credibility intervals don't overlap, then there's uh, a significant, significant difference in terms of the probability of, of habitat use for that species. And over on the right here, you've got those species that are predominantly or have a higher probability of being found on a coral reef. And over on the right, are those that are, have a much higher probability of being seen on an algal dependent um, environment. So all up, we saw about uh, 25 of the species that we got reasonable data for, about 45% were only found on coral reefs, but there was also some that were only ever found in those macroalgal beds. And interestingly, we did get that um, some of those species, four of them in fact, uh, only we found them also as adults on the coral reef, so it's giving some sort of suggestion that there's an ontogenetic shift between those two habitats, similar to what is often described in um, places like the Caribbean where you've got seagrass beds very close to the coral reef. Okay, the types of species we're seeing on, um, on the coral reefs are, I, I guess, your usual sparse suspects, um, things like pomocentrids and the and some of the uh, ketodontids and labyrinths and the like. And then in the actual algal meadows, um, you know, some of the acanthurids or surgeon fish and, and um, goat fish. But perhaps the most interesting find was that we saw, I think, you know, when we were doing this particular part of the study, some well over a hundred of the left rhinids, and they were all always within these macroalgal beds. And that was quite an important time because at Ningaloo it's the left rhinids which are targeted primarily by the recreational fishes. So understanding where they're recruiting to is, has obviously has some major management implications in terms of looking to protect that, that habitat. If you now, um, this now is looking at the percentage of those fish that we actually saw associated with live coral. And the dotted line here, which is at about 37%, just represents the average coral cover across the race. And it gives you some sort of idea of um, what the fish are using relative to what habitat they're using relative to its availability in terms of coral. And again, over on the left are the species that are predominantly using coral, and on the left, I'm sorry, on the right, for those that are somewhat avoiding it. So we found that there were 14 species, or about 25% of them, that have really strong affiliations with uh, live coral. And, I mean, a lot of this is not surprising. These are some of the smaller homocentrids and, again, the ketodontids, which we know throughout their lifetime have strong associations with live coral. But interestingly, there were um, four of those species which as adults don't really have a strong affiliation with live coral. And this sort of promotes the idea which has been suggested like um, people like Jeff Jones, that there, for some species, a much stronger reliance on live coral during the early life history stages. Okay, the, in this um, figure, I've just added uh, the dark bars represent uh, the percentage of fish that were associated with the coral skeletons or dead coral. And you can see that there's a number of species here that have quite close associations with the coral skeleton and not necessarily the live coral itself. In particular, if you look at, consider that dead coral represented about approximately 20% of the available habitat 
there were three species that when you look at the error bars relative to availability, they're significantly using that habitat or favoring that habitat. Interestingly, these are um, you know, key sort of species in terms of their functional role, particularly the, the two scarab species. Okay, and the final little graph that I have here looks at the specific microhabitats that some of these coral dependent species are using. So in orange is the proportion of each of the coral types that they were using and then in black is the availability of each of those habitats. And where you see a, a little plus signal above the habitat type that indicates that when we uh, carried out selectivity indices that that particular microhabitat was selected for or there's some sort of preference for that, that particular habitat. The interesting thing here is that it's really these sort of corombose and plate type corals that are being faded and I guess that's somewhat to do with uh, the type of environment or the refuge that they provide so the space between the branches um, is ideal for them as a, a predator refuge and you compare that to like uh, some of the massive corals and even the branching <coughs> corals which weren't so important and one of the interesting things here is that uh, those particular corals are also the sorts of things that are going to be highly susceptible to things like predation by Drapella, which is a um, major predator of corals at Ningaloo Reef. Also um, things like disease and bleaching. So you might expect that if there's um, major disturbances that affect these corals, it can have major implications in terms of the recruitment of these fish and then some flow-on effects to the actual population. Okay, so just in summary of um, the whole talk, 45% of the species that we saw were exclusively on coral reefs as juveniles, but only 25% of those associated with the live coral. Um, that's still you know, considerably higher than the 10% that we sort of estimate are on, uh, closest, closely associated with corals as adults for food or refuge. Among the coral uh, dependent species, they tend to have a, a high association with these corombos and plating type growth morphologies, which are highly susceptible to disturbance. And perhaps one of the more sort of interesting and applicable to management type uh, findings from this whole project was that the macro algal meadows seem to be extremely important for a number of species, have a different community of juvenile fish associated with them. <coughs> And in particular, species that are particular are really important for the recreational fishery. And um, I believe that in a talk later this afternoon, or, uh, Chris Fulton is going to sort of build on some of the information that we've been collected for on these macroalgal fields or meadows. And with that, I'd like to just um, thank, in particular, uh, people within the Department of Environment and Conservation in the regional offices who always give us a, a great deal of support when we go up there and work in places like Exmouth and Nimbalooka.